Good morning, Greg. Good morning, everyone. And thank you for joining us for today's Knockout Open Abuse Day Learning Series webinar. This webinar series is a continuation, as Greg mentioned, of Knockout Opiate Abuse Day, which has been designated as October 6th each year by Governor Murphy. And this learning series is designed to continue that awareness and education highlighted by that initiative throughout the year so we can continue to focus on these messages. Today's webinar, Post-Operative Pain and Alternatives to Opioids, is a topic of significant importance as we look at strategies to tackle the opiate and addiction crisis that is ravaging our state. And we're pleased to be able to bring additional focus to this very important topic today. This webinar today is brought to you by the Opioid Education Foundation of America and the Partnership for a Drug-Free New Jersey. And it is being held in collaboration with NJ Cares and the New Jersey Office of the Attorney General. And I thank them for their partnership support and collaboration on today's learning activity. And I welcome all of our attendees from New Jersey and from across the country uh, to today's learning event. Our featured expert speaker is Sarah Serretto. She has worked as a registered nurse for six years, a graduate of William Patterson University. She currently practices at Hackensack University Medical Center as a staff nurse with solid organ transplant and urology surgery. Sarah is double board certified in medical surgical nursing and holistic nursing from the American Nurses Credentialing Center, and she currently sits as a Nursing Congress Chair for Hackensack Meridian Health. Sarah will graduate with her MSN in Executive Nursing and Nursing Administration in June of 2022. So now I welcome Sarah. Thank you for joining us today, and I will turn the presentation over to you. Thank you very much, Angela. Thank you for that introduction. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for your time today. Our topic of post-operative pain and alternatives to opioids is critical since the introduction of opioids is frequently started after a patient has surgery. Somebody who has never been prescribed opioids before may have the need for opioids after surgery, and this can start a likelihood of dependency depending on the patient. So in light of time, let's jump right in. This presentation is informative and educational. This is not individual medical advice. Please always discuss your individual care with your healthcare team. This presentation is delivered from an independently licensed practitioner and does not represent a business entity. My name is Sarah Vicerato. Thank you for the introduction, Angela. We're gonna be discussing preparation for surgery to improve post-operative pain. We'll discuss alternatives to opioids, opioid management and safety. Why are we talking about this? Surgical preparedness improves post-operative pain management. Understanding different types of pain, understanding your personal level of resilience and its impact on post-operative pain and how that can decrease your need for opioids is very important as a patient and a provider. We would like to increase the likelihood of using non-opioid techniques independently or in conjunction with opioids and with an overall goal to improve opioid safety. The learning objectives today are to implement pre-surgery preparation strategies to improve post-operative pain management and reduce the use of opioids to develop an individualized post-operative pain management plan based on the surgical type to incorporate non-opioid pain management strategies and to develop client-specific goals with personal and cultural factors in mind that affect pain management. It's important to incorporate effective non-opioid pain management interventions in your practice as practitioners and to describe safe use of opioids post-operatively, including strategies to minimize adverse side effects and use. Preparing for surgery. If you were going to run a marathon, would you show up that day never having trained? Absolutely not. Preparing for surgery is similar to training for a marathon. As an individual, you want to train, develop a training regimen that's appropriate to the severity of the marathon. Part of this is understanding what are you going to experience before, during, and after surgery. In order to become prepared, there are types of questions that you want to be asking yourself and your surgeon. What kind of pain am I going to expect? How long of a recovery should I plan for? Are there tools that I can do to reduce pain, medications or non-medication interventions? What kind of prescription should I be anticipating after surgery? Are there prescriptions I'm going to be going home on? 
these types of questions will have a level of preparation in your mind that can reduce anxiety. The unknown element of surgery adds to anxiety, which can decrease your ability to tolerate pain. In light of that, you might end up needing more opioids. The idea is the more prepared you are for surgery, the level of anxiety may be decreased, which may lead to a decreased need for opioid pain medications. There are different types of surgery, cardiac, orthopedic, abdominal, neurological. We'll talk about the types of pain that you may expect with each type of surgery and the types of pain management interventions. The very first step when you're planning a surgery is pain self-assessment. This Wong Baker Faces Pain Rating Scale is a scale that you'll see in the hospital. It's a good idea to know what to anticipate. The healthcare providers are going to ask you what is your level of pain. As an individual, a self-assessment will give you the ability to know what is a level of pain that's tolerable to you. The goal is individualized care. Every single patient, every person has a different level of pain that's tolerable to them. A provider cannot tell you what pain level is acceptable or not acceptable. That's simply not how pain works. But having this pain rating scale in your head can give you a bit of an idea of what level you can get up and ambulate, of what level you can absolutely not move. And this will help you work as a team with your healthcare provider to determine what level of pain requires intervention, what level of pain requires non-opioid intervention, and what level requires maybe an opioid inter intervention. Preparing for surgery. The very first step of scheduling surgery is determining your family and friends support. This might seem like an outlier point, but it's very important. When you're in your preoperative appointment with your surgeon, Picking a date, you don't wanna pick a date where you're running solo at home, where you're being discharged without family and friends support. Having support around you increases your ability to manage your everyday life after surgery and also inpatient. Pick a day when you have people who can come visit you in the hospital if it's COVID appropriate, who can make sure that you have items that you need at home, who can drive back and forth to doctor's appointments decreasing the outliers that will cause stress will help you be able to tolerate the surgical stress itself and can decrease the need for opioid interventions just by decreasing anxiety alone. The question and answer session with the surgeon during your pre-admission appointment is very important. Have a small notebook, write down questions that you think of throughout your time at home thinking about your surgery, bring them with you to the office. Write down any answers that you want to remember and have an honest conversation with the surgeon. After my surgery, do you anticipate that I'm going to need to go to rehab or am I going to be able to go home? What day should I anticipate being discharged? What kind of post-operative day should I expect on day one, day two, day three? Having a prepared level of knowledge of what each day is going to look like is going to be easier for you in the hospital a pathway of day one, day two, day three, with just a general idea of what's going to happen will decrease the shock factor. And the shock factor matters because when you're nervous, you're anxious, you've never been in the hospital before. Having just a few familiar ideas of what is going on can bring your heart rate down, can make you feel more comfortable in your environment and can give you the ability to tolerate the pain better. A side note for rehab versus home discharge, a good idea if your surgeon says there's a possibility you might need to go to rehab, vet some rehabs in the area, look around you, ask your friends, ask your family, have you had any good experiences with rehab? That way, when the social worker and the case manager walk in your room and say, the surgeon is suggesting that you go to rehab for a week, these, this is a list of insurance company approved rehabs, that list now doesn't seem so anxiety driving. You've seen a few of these names, you know out of these 10 rehabs, these are the three or four that we've considered. Something so simple as that decreases that overall fear and that overwhelming sense of, I don't know what's going on, I have no control of the situation, I have no control of where I'm going. A sense of control, a sense of being a partner in care, matters. Something so simple as looking up a few rehabs can help give you that feeling. 
establishing personal goals. In your conversation with a surgeon, it's important to decide and discuss what are your personal goals related to your surgery. If you have a wedding that you need to go to, maybe don't schedule your surgery the week before that wedding. It seems simple, but at the end of the day, when you're in an appointment, your preoperative appointment to schedule your surgery, you might not be thinking of something like that. So go home, talk to your family. What are your goals? What works for you? What doesn't work for you? And be honest with your provider. It's also a good idea to discuss hospital support. If you've never been an inpatient in the hospital before, this can be one of the scariest times of your life. And as providers, we need to remember that as well. We need to take a pause before we walk in the door. Has this patient experienced a healthcare provider? Do they know what a resident is, what a nurse, what a nursing assistant does, what an attending is? Probably not. So in that preoperative appointment, a great way to prepare the patient and decrease anxiety is to tell the patient, how often should they expect to see you? How often should they expect to see your resident, your nurse practitioner? Something so simple as that will give the patient the ability to plan for that mental load. I know multiple people are going to be walking into my room. There's going to be multiple faces. It's less anxiety driving. Psychologically preparing for surgery, having appropriate expectations is beneficial. In your Q&A with the surgeon, what level of pain do you think I should be expecting on the first six hours after surgery? Are you anticipating I'm going to be getting out of bed the first six hours after surgery? Or am I going to be in the ICU for two days? It is all dependent on the type of surgery. But having those appropriate expectations, again, will empower you as part of the healthcare team. You will not feel like things are happening to you, but rather things are happening together. And that changes the entire conversation of healthcare, which decreases sometimes the fear. And the fear factor can increase the use of opioid pain medications. A discussion with yourself. What is your pain tolerance level? Have you had pain before? If you have, what have you done for the pain? That we'll talk about in a, in a little bit with a, a few slides later, but there is an element of pain naivety and pain tolerance. So an honest discussion with yourself prior to even scheduling a surgery is critical. You'll be able to be self-aware and have a bit of an idea of what level of pain can I handle. Your self-awareness of your own needs and your personalized goal will help you establish a, a healthy element in the hospital where you can bring in individualized comfort measures. So if you are aware that this pillow, this blanket, this song, this movie are all good distraction techniques for me, bring them with you. Those individualized comfort measures may seem small, but when something's happening that you're not comfortable with, they can distract you, they can provide you comfort, they can be a method of support. So the self-awareness of those needs is very important. And also try to decrease your external stressors. It sounds ridiculous. You're scheduling a surgery. Of course, you're going to be stressed. Anyone who tells you to not be stressed around surgery is lying to you. The idea is if you have control over a different external stressor, take control and try to decrease it. Maybe it's something simple as you know that after surgery, you're going to be on a clear liquid diet. Have someone else go to ShopRite, give them the list, let them fill the fridge. If there's anything that you can take off your plate, take it off. Decreasing that extra stress can help you establish a personal sense of zen prior to going into the surgery. And physically, that does matter. Stress is stress. Your body knows when you are in fight or flight. Decreasing that high anxiety, that, that element of fear will help you physically ready for surgery. Weight optimization is a very good goal preoperatively. Depending on what type of surgery you have, obviously there's a different factor. If you have abdominal surgery, the higher level of visceral fat does play a part in abdominal surgery. In orthopedic surgery, it does as well. If you're doing surgery on an organ that has a lot of pressure from extra weight, the surgery itself will go smoother with less weight. 
So trying to have an optimized weight for your body type for your height is certainly beneficial for you months prior to the surgery. Activity optimization, same thing. Increasing your activity prior to surgery will increase your ability to reach your post-operative activity goal. So if your goal is simply to walk up and down the stairs after surgery, maybe start to increase your activity as much as you possibly can prior to surgery. And think of that activity goal post-operatively. Communicate that clearly with your provider, with the physical therapist, with your nurse. You want to create a healthcare team where you work together. And that will help you create a medication plan that everybody is in agreement on that is best for you in that situation. Optimizing your clearance organs. Your kidney and your liver are the two organs that really help clear all of the medications that you're going to be getting before surgery, during surgery, and after surgery. So decreasing anything that is impairing the physical ability of your kidney and your liver to work is always a good idea. The healthier that your body is going into surgery, the easier your recovery will be coming out of surgery. So decreasing those toxins such as drinking, heavy seed oils, fried foods, et cetera, and your lung function, quitting smoking is something that will of course be beneficial to you prior to surgery as during any surgery where you need to be under respiratory support, healthier, clear lungs handle being intubated, meaning having respiratory support much better than lungs that are actively smoking. Physically preparing your home environment, Discuss with your surgeon, am I going to be able to go up the stairs? If the answer is no, it might be something so simple as moving your lazy boy from your upstairs office to your downstairs living room. But preparing that home environment, now you've mentally set yourself up where in your post-operative plan on you know day three, day four, when you're being discharged, you are not nervous, you are not anxious because you know going home you are ready. And those small things of anxiety, they do impact your need for opioids. Assess your discharge needs, figure out what you need at home, what you need immediately after surgery. If immediately after surgery, you feel settled and taken care of and safe, you will have a higher chance of being able to tolerate the pain. Mind and body connection, mind over matter is real. If you have a certain level of pain that's tolerable to you, that level of pain is tolerable because your mind is able to control what you are feeling, what you were thinking. So if you have a level three or a level four as an individual, if that level is tolerable for you, you can work at home and try to see at what point is it not tolerable? And at what point can I not control my emotional response, my heightened response to whatever pain is in my way? and assess your own pain tolerance. And then chiropractic maintenance, if it's appropriate for your surgery, as we said before, the overall wellness of your body, the healthier that you are, the easier your post-operative recovery will be, the better you heal, decrease need for opioids. Understanding opioids and medication side effects. Opioids are potent analgesics. It's important to understand what the side effects are when you are being offered and when you are developing a pain management plan with your healthcare team. Side effects, constipation, nausea, dizziness, confusion, altered mental status, a risk of dependency, respiratory depression, meaning where your respiratory rate will decrease from sedation, hyperalgesia, which is simply just the, the heightened increased sensitivity to pain and extreme response to pain. Urinary retention can be a side effect, meaning you cannot pee, you cannot empty your bladder from heavy opioid use, sedation, and a delayed recovery. So understanding these side effects matters because in a post-operative moment, let's say you're one day after surgery and you know, with you and your healthcare team, you've developed a pain management plan where you're only going to, let's say, take an opioid if your level hits a six or a seven. You're making a conscious decision that you know the side effects. You're making a well-informed decision. When you're at that six, can you do something that's a non-opioid intervention to bring you back down to a five or do you need the opioid? And the only way that you make that well-informed, well-educated conscious decision is by understanding the side effects and understanding your options. Types of pain. 
There are different types of pain that are dependent on the surgery. There's incisional pain, gas pain, surgical pain, acute versus chronic pain, nerve pain, muscular, joint, and radiating. A side note of acute versus chronic pain. If you have a history of pain, a history of opioid use, a history of alcohol use, that needs to be clearly communicated and you need to develop a plan with your provider. And providers, your interview with your patient needs to be comprehensive and honest. The use of opioids or heavy alcohol prior to surgery, or even if you're in recovery or on some kind of therapy, such as methadone therapy, their pain management plan will be different. The goal is individualized care, always. So that conversation with the patient is critical. What is the history? What have you used in the past? Maybe something has worked for you or something has not worked for you. Or if you're somebody who is on a scheduled maintenance drug, that maintenance drug, the dosing, the, the efficacy that it works for you needs to be communicated. Is that acute versus chronic pain? It's going to be treated differently post-operatively. Depending on the type of surgery, there are other non-opioid pain management options for each type of pain. So incisional pain, depending on the surgery, frequently you'll see alternating acetaminophen and ibuprofen. There are situations where acetaminophen is not appropriate in liver failure, where ibuprofen is not appropriate, let's say in renal impairment, meaning that your kidneys don't function well, or in some kind of GI disorder, such as ulcerative colitis. This is an individual conversation with your healthcare provider. It's a simple question. Are there non-opioid or non-narcotic pain medications that I can take at a scheduled interval after the surgery that will keep my pain at an acceptable level, a three or a four, that will decrease my need to take opioids? That conversation as a provider to the patient is very similar we're going to be using non-opioid medications to maintain a pain level, to try to decrease that sharp 10 out of 10 pain, which is much harder to bring back down the scale. We'd like to keep you at a level that's acceptable with an appropriate expectation, understanding that we still have surgery. Positional awareness, identifying triggers, coughing, sneezing, laughing, lack of movement, stiffness, all of these things as a patient and a provider, you wanna be aware of what's going on. What are the triggers in incisional pain? If you teach your patient that when you're expecting a cough or you're expecting a sneeze, to grab a pillow, pull it into their belly, to displace the pressure to the sides away from the incisions, that will help the patient. As a patient, you can simply ask your provider, is there anything that I can do? I know that I'm having some incisional pain. What are my other options? What else can I do besides take an opioid? Ambulation is critical, similar with gas pain. Following an ambulation schedule and a post-operative diet will help decrease constipation, and that will actually help improve gas pain after surgery. It's also important to avoid constipation. A side effect of opioids is constipation. A side effect of abdominal surgery is constipation, which both put pressure on your incisions. So following a bowel regimen, ambulation, following the diet as prescribed is critical. And this is all working as a team with your healthcare provider. Surgical pain, you may also see an alternation of acetaminophen and ibuprofen. Similar, identify your triggers, ambulate. Acute versus chronic pain, as we talked about, opioid naivety versus opioid tolerance changes the level of medication that you're going to take. It changes the plan as an overall healthcare team. So in that first interview with your patient or in that interview with your surgeon, it's important to determine what is your history of pain? What is your history of opioid abuse? Nerve pain, identify your triggers, and temperature change. Something so simple as hot and cold can have an effect on whatever type of pain you're dealing with. It doesn't hurt to try hot therapy or cold therapy in conjunction with your acetaminophen and ibuprofen or in conjunction with an opioid if that is necessary. But the idea is that you are integrating non-opioid pain medications with other medications as well. 
circulation support, such as compression stockings, moving around, anticonvulsants, you'll also see sometimes as a provider, you'll see them in surgery, you can also see them being used to prevent pain prior to surgery. As a patient, the question here stays the same. What kind of medications can I be using that are not opioids and have that conversation with your healthcare team? Muscular pain, identifying triggers, ambulating, working with a physical therapist. You can also try hot and cold therapy again, stretches, and decreasing whatever stressor is irritating that muscular pain. Similar joint pain, physical therapy. You want to work with your healthcare team, try those changes. Topical NSAIDs, you'll see lidocaine applied topically. You might see patches. Um, new research is coming out on intraoperative MMDA receptor antagonists, which are a medicine called Ketalar, commonly known as ketamine. As a patient, you don't need to know any specifics about these types of medications. You're similar just saying to your surgeon, I'm just curious, does your practice use any non-opioid medications in the surgery to help me not need as many opioid medications after the surgery? As a provider, keep an eye out for changes in the literature and changes in practice that we're seeing more frequently medications being used, infusions being used during surgery to prevent the need for so much opioid use after surgery. Radiating pain, that hot and cold therapy, ambulation, avoiding triggers, and more anticonvulsants. Some other non-opioid pain management interventions. As we talked about in the beginning, your self-awareness of comfort measures and distraction, te distraction techniques that work for you is critical. It's very important that each individual patient, that you take a moment, that you talk to yourself, what works for me when I am so stressed that I can't function? Is it listening to music? Is it lighting candles? Is it going for a walk? What in your world helps take away that acute, inability to handle pain or a stressor. Sometimes it's ambulation and movement. Sometimes after surgery, you're stuck in the bed. You feel cramped. Your muscles are tight. You haven't moved now. You were sitting on an OR table for four or five hours, depending on what the surgery is. Discuss with your healthcare team. When can I get up? Is it good for me to get up? Can I sit in a chair? Can I walk around the halls? Ambulation and movement are critical for healing. Hot and cold therapy, psychological control and distraction techniques, such as using music therapy, distracting yourself with, is there a movie that you like? Do you prefer to read? Obviously, when you are in acute pain, you might not instantly want to read. You might not want to instantly watch a movie. That's understandable. The idea is you have mind and body control. You have psychological control. You identify what works for you and you bring that with you after the surgery. Aromatherapy. Aromatherapy has actually been seen in the literature as a, as a distraction technique, but also a way to manage postoperative pain. We've seen it in postoperative nausea. You can also see it in postoperative anxiety. Many institutions are now incorporating it into their practice. You can ask your provider, is aromatherapy something that you offer? Is it something that I can bring myself, et cetera? Alternating between acetaminophen and NSAIDs. Steroid therapy, you may also see. You can ask your provider, is there a type of medication that reduces inflammation? Topical agents, decreasing stimulation. If you're in pain and there's 15 people talking in your room, the TV is blaring, the door is open, and you're hearing all of the other beeping from the other patients, and your heart rate is going up, you feel like you're throbbing, and you simply just cannot calm down, decreasing stimulation will often help. And you can combine that with the other non-opioid pain man management interventions. You put heat packs on your shoulders, you put a lavender ice pack on your eyes, you shut the door, you close the, you close the blinds, you turn the TV off, you put some light music on. Those things seem simple, but that is what increases your tolerance of the pain and the stressor and it can decrease your need for that opioid pain medication. In that moment, maybe you are just on Tylenol and ibuprofen and your Tylenol is not due for another 45 minutes. Your instinct might say, I need something stronger, but can you make it wait? 
Can you pull it a little bit further? Can you decrease that stimulation? Can you increase your psychological control? Can you distract yourself? Can you make your environment more conducive to your version of healing? And can you make it that 45 minutes? If you practice prior to the surgery, you probably can. And that's what that's where preparation comes in. That's where knowing yourself, knowing what works for you and bringing it to the hospital, that's where that matters. In those moments where you need to stretch just a little bit more. If your goal is I only want the Tylenol and the ibuprofen, I don't want to resort to a breakthrough opioid using those techniques can get you there. Anti-seizure medications such as gabapentin, Lyrica, you can see them used preoperatively pre as well to prevent a increased need for opioids after the surgery. Reflexology and acupuncture, you might start seeing them a little bit more in bigger institutions. There are some institutions that are using reflexology and acupuncture postoperatively. Guided meditation, many, many institutions now have guided meditation available on their TVs. This is something that is not going to work for you if you have not done it prior though. When you're in pain, if it's an acute episode of pain, all of a sudden you're not going to be able to snap out and use guided meditation. This is an active practice that you would have to consciously do prior to surgery but it can be used and it can be very successful, but it is not something that you just pick up and start doing one day. If you're planning a surgery and you know you have a scheduled procedure in six months, this is something that it might be beneficial for you to start practicing now. That way, when you're in that acute moment of pain, you have the psychological ability to put yourself in that guided meditation zone and get yourself out of your body for a moment to get through that acute episode of pain. Massage therapy can also be used. It's not often seen in institutions, um, but you might, be, you might see it here and there. It can be used in certain types of pain. Environmental optimization, as we talked about before, making your environment conducive to what healing is to you will help decrease that overwhelming sense of anxiety, of stress, of the inability to tolerate the situation and can decrease the need for opioids. What are your pain management goals? Individualized care is always the goal. Developing your individualized goal is important because then you as an individual and your healthcare team know as a team, what are we working towards? You wanna improve your functional ability, reaching your personal post-operative goal, and is your goal to utilize non-opioid interventions. Maybe your goal is to use non-opioid interventions first. Maybe your goal is just to use them together, or maybe you have no real idea of what you want. So you want to try a couple of things out. I wanted to try to use the heat packs and the cold packs, but I might also need something else. Communicate with your team, whatever works for you, it should be individualized. And you want to reach your discharge goal. If your goal is to be discharged without a prescription for opioid pain medication, you need to communicate with your provider and figure out on day one, two, three, four, five, what medications are we going to be using to titrate down where I can ambulate, go up the stairs, do whatever I need to do without needing pain medication. Depending on the type of surgery, you may need to utilize opioids. There's nothing wrong with figuring out that opioids are appropriate for that specific time. The idea is that you're preparing yourself for the surgery, preparing your mentality and preparing your body so that you will heal better, faster and easier where you will not need as many opioids. Discussing post-operative pain management prior to surgery is critical. You do not wanna come into a situation where you're unprepared, where you don't know what your options are. And all of a sudden now you're taking a very strong pain medication, let's say IV pain medication every four hours that you're not realizing is causing constipation can cause dependency. We need to be partners in care, the healthcare provider and the patient. Discuss the post-operative pain management plan, your preferences and your goals, and that will lead to the best patient outcome. Around the clock non-opioid use, you will see specifically in surgery, you'll see 
alternating acetaminophen and ibuprofen around the clock, meaning you'll have acetaminophen every six hours, let's say ibuprofen maybe every four hours, and they alternate if appropriate to the surgery. That way you never have a body that has no element of pain control in it. So the idea is that you stay at a level amount of pain that's appropriate to the surgery and you only use opioids as breakthrough pain relief. Now, if you have a patient that has had opioids in the past, this may not work as well. And you may have around the clock, low dose opioid use and have breakthrough pain relief. That is specific to the patient, specific to that situation, to the surgery. So that has to be discussed with the healthcare team. Controlled pain, establishing your pain goal. Prevent the 10 out of 10 if possible. If you des decide that you're at a goal of a three and ambulating is making you go to a six out of 10, utilizing that opioid to optimize that activity might be appropriate. If ambulation is what's necessary to promote healing, then maybe you need to utilize that opioid. But ask questions. What is this medication? Is it an opioid? Do I need it? What's the side effect? Communication about pain and pain management. An element here is the honesty and the transparency in communication. From patient to provider, use descriptive adjectives. Explain what's going on so they can best help you. Are you burning? Are you stabbing? Are you shooting? Can you tolerate the throbbing, but you can't tolerate the stabbing? That will help you establish clear goals. There needs to be a transparent level of communication, a willingness to communicate the pain. Providers need to be aware that patients might be fearful to communicate pain, that they don't wanna be a problem patient. That's something that has to be transparent. So you have a effective Q&A with your patient, effective patient interviews, establish a solid rapport with your provider, with your patient, and transparency. What are you feeling? Are there perceived stigmas here? Is the patient afraid to communicate pain? Talk to them about that. And cultural awareness. Are there communication barriers? Is there a stigma? Is the patient feeling like they need to tolerate the pain? This brings us to practitioner unconscious bias. Implicit bias is harboring unconscious attitudes and stereotypes. So as a provider, there is a possibility that you were coming into that room, the patient is saying that they're in a 10 out of 10 pain and unconsciously you don't believe them. This is not something that any healthcare provider wants to do, but it happens frequently. In order to nip it in the bud, we have to be practical. It has a negative impact on patient care. Implicit bias decreases quality of care. It decreases the quality outcome. It impacts the patient's entire perception of healthcare. It decreases their follow-up and it decreases their trust in healthcare, where they now have, they're talking to their family, where they have no level of trust. Now their entire family is not going to go to their initial visit, is not going to go to their follow-up. In general, implicit bias is not a good way to promote healthcare. So when we're talking about pain, if your patient is communicating with you that there are different levels of pain that they're experiencing, we have to be aware and we have to reduce our implicit bias in order to develop that individualized plan, to develop that pain management schedule with that patient that's appropriate to that patient. The first thing to do is address the language barrier. Self-reflect on your comfort level. Are you comfortable having a conversation with a patient through a translator? If not, you need to have a conversation with the translator prior to having this conversation about pain where maybe the conversation will be as effective. Practice your skill of self-awareness, recognize your stereotypes, your consciously adjust your response to the situation. Put yourself in that patient's shoes. What are they feeling? Have they been in the hospital before? Have they had surgery before? What are they going through? Individualized care and build your rapport with your patient. Use teach back, understand where they're coming from and make sure that after your education that they're teaching you back appropriately to confirm what you are teaching is getting through. Effective patient interviews from a patient perspective and a provider perspective. We have to be honest with one another. We have to effectively get to the root of what matters. Another external way to reduce implicit bias as a provider, it's always a good idea to watch and read perspective literature and film that will help put yourself in another individual's shoes, help broaden your cultural view. 
Self-care, emotional regulation skills, and positive mental health and mindfulness all do matter. If you're going into the situation in an unhealthy mindset and the patient is complaining of some kind of pain, you're going to see that as just that, complaining. You're not going to be a partner in care. Opioid safety, as an inpatient, as a patient from their perspective, try to avoid hyper-awareness of time. Every single pain medication, opioid or non-opioid, is going to have a every six hour, every four hour rule. The idea is you want to follow your body signs to determine your medication requirements and not follow the clock. Avoid the 10 out of 10 where you're listening to your body, you're starting to feel like you can't tolerate it, communicate that to your healthcare provider. Utilizing the non-opioid options in an individualized plan with realistic expectations that are appropriate to you. And if you go home with opioids as an outpatient, it's important to understand safe storage, appropriate disposal, make sure that your opioids are not in any reach of children, of somebody who it's not prescribed to, locked cabinets are always a good idea. Maintain the around-the-clock schedule of your acetaminophen and your ibuprofen if it's appropriately prescribed. Maintain your bowel regimen, your ambulation. Continue to avoid hyper-awareness of time. Have realistic, ex realistic expectations and identify and avoid your triggers at home as well. Now there's the element of unscheduled surgery. What do you do if you would love to prepare for all of these things, but you go into the ER with pain, they tell you you need a lap coli, you need your gallbladder removed. Have that same Q&A with the surgeon. Have that same Q&A with the staff. Try to rally the troops of your friends and family support. And in whatever time you have, do that self-scan. What is your self-assessment? What is your self-awareness of your needs and your comfort measures? Can you get them to the hospital? And any individualized anxiety support that you can rally up, do so. Understand that you have to give yourself a bit of grace. If it's an unscheduled surgery, it's going to be a little bit more chaotic, a little bit more hectic, but you can still use some of those comfort measures to bring down that anxiety to hopefully decrease the need for increased opioid use. We're going to do a Q&A session. I appreciate all of your attention today and any questions I will be very happy to answer. If we run out of time and there are questions, um, I will be available via, via email and Angela will figure that out. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, what a really comprehensive presentation to uh, discuss the uh, themes that have kind of been running through this, this learning series when we talk about safe prescribing, uh, specifically uh, conversations, and also, you know, looking at keeping uh, patients opiate naive and, and looking at alternatives. So um, appreciate everything that you spoke about. I'm going to go right into the questions because we have about 10 minutes and we had um, a number of questions. Um, first, I, I think if you could just kind of expand on this. So there was a question that said, so, um, Basically, what we're talking about here is patients um, having an acceptable amount of pain so that they don't turn to opioids where they may have no pain. Can you talk a little bit about that and what the benefits are of uh, looking at alternatives to opioids um, and kind of utilizing these strategies? I know you touched on it, but if you could provide um, some additional clarification because there's questions about that. Sure. So the question is, why would you want to use non-opioid interventions? Is that kind of what the question Correct. is? Correct. Why would you okay. want to use non-opioid um, sure. interventions if you still may have some pain that you have to uh, deal with, whether it be through distraction or right. some of these other things? Yes. So that's really a two-part answer because there is the realistic expectation of some level of pain after surgery. And that is something that Mentally, you want to prepare yourself for, depending on what's appropriate for the surgery, which is why the Q&A with the surgeon is critical. If you are having, let's say, an abdominal surgery, you can't anticipate a level zero. That's not realistic. It's not really the goal. If you have some kind of surgical intervention, there's going to be a level of discomfort. The idea is that that discomfort needs to be tolerable. It's not that it's non-existent. So finding your level of tolerable with non-opioid interventions is really the goal. If you have a three or a four and you can tolerate it with your heat packs, your ice packs, your distraction, where you're not 
introducing opioids into the body that have a risk of dependency, then you are leaving that surgical intervention in a much better outcome where you're not going home, possibly taking your opioids around the clock kind of unsupervised. So the idea is if you can avoid starting them, you're probably in a better situation than somebody who is just taking the op opioids for a three or a four of pain. All right, thanks for touching on that. And in particular yesterday, I know the CDC um, released some data that said that um, nationally, uh, the number of overdose deaths have reached a record high. New Jersey was one of those states that um, one of the few states, I believe three states that did not have an increase. And Dr. Andrew Kolodny from Brandeis University spoke about um, in response, the fact that um, that so many people may have already been addicted prior to uh, the COVID pandemic and the isolation that that brought on due to um, prescribing. Um, as I mentioned, New Jersey was one of those states that didn't have the increase, and New Jersey also has a mandate that requires that at a time an opioid is prescribed, that um, uh, information is provided um, to the patient on um, the potential for dependency and addiction, as well as alternatives. Can you speak to, to that? Um, do you feel that that is a protective factor? Obviously, you spoke a lot about communication, but um, you know some of the benefits of, of those types of conversations. Sure, absolutely. Well, the the idea is that if you go in for a surgery that's, let's say, two, three hours long, you go home that next morning with a prescription for 50 Percocets, you're putting the patient at risk because then the patient has access to this medication that has a risk of dependency and has severe side effects without a healthcare provider, you know, directly there to kind of be the gatekeeper and explain to them this is more appropriate timing, et cetera. So having a, a law in effect in New Jersey is certainly beneficial because it decreases the number of actual opioid pills that the patient has access to, and it increases the conversation and the communication where the opioid is now significant. It's a significant prescription. It's a full conversation to have. It's, it's not just, here's this prescription, take it as you please. You the worst thing that you want, the last thing that you want is the patient to go home and be taking the opioids around the clock when it was not necessary and develop dependency that leads to addiction, that leads to worse you know, use such as heroin use. So I do think that the, the law is certainly beneficial, but I, I think that the communication factor is critical and the lack of overprescribing, it changes the game of opioid use. It, it decreases the patient's ability to access opioids that maybe they don't necessarily need. And it also decreases the likelihood of it getting into the wrong hands. Thanks. And adding to that, we had a question. Um, how would you talk to patients who insist on uh, receiving opioids or narcotics? The key is a well-informed decision with making the plan as a team. So the conversation can't be provider dictating to the patient what is right for them. That's instantly going to create fear. It's going to ruin rapport, ruin trust. It has to be a mutual decision, a mutual conversation. So you sit down, you get eye contact, you, your one-to-one -one conversation. Maybe you have to ask other people to leave the room. It has to be a human connection where you're explaining, these are the side effects. This is what could possibly happen a fear in healthcare, a fear of mine, is that you will end up with some kind of level of dependency, that the constipation will be increased, that there's a risk of some kind of intervention that we don't want. These are our options. We can try this first. How does that sound to you? What kind of plan do we wanna make? And if the opioid is a necessity for that patient, then we're gonna develop a plan of coming down off of it. Okay, so if you need the opioid, let's say every four hours right now, because that's what's getting you out of bed, then let's work at 10 o'clock tonight. Let's try to get to six hours. Let's get to eight hours. We're working together to meet the outcome, to reach the same goal. The conversation has to be both sided or else you're going to lose the patient and the opioid is going to be the only answer for them. All right, thanks. And then we had another question. Um, what should I tell my patients when headed to the emergency room for pain to ensure that they're not automatically prescribed opioids? 
I would tell the patient to have a conversation when they first arrive that their goal is to stay opioid free and tell the patient to, when they go into the ER and they're having a conversation with the nurse or with the doctor to ask, what is each medication prescribed? What is the goal of that medication? What are the side effects of that medication? And if your goal is to avoid opioids altogether, to be clear and to just state that right off the fact, the second that you're, you know, in the presence of whatever provider is going to be prescribing for you. I don't think any provider would really give you much pushback on that. If you're working together, if you're developing, you know, a plan together, you walk in and you say, I'm in abdominal pain, but I do not want opioids. All right, thanks. And so for our attendees, I know uh, the poll just launched and we're coming up to uh, the final few minutes of our uh, presentation, but we have some time for um, some additional questions. We had a question, um, Sarah, um, what would you suggest for patients who cannot tolerate uh, NSAIDs? There are multiple conditions where they can't tolerate NSAIDs. Um, there's a little bit of research coming out about certain conditions that they can tolerate NSAIDs more than was previously thought. So I think it has to be a conversation depending on what specific issue you're dealing with. But in that case, then you would lean towards using acetaminophen probably around the clock um, and maybe increase your non-opioid interventions then instead of having one intervention, let's say, you know, you're your Tylenol and your aromatherapy, maybe you're using three or four together. Try to stack them in conjunction with the acetaminophen to make up for the lack of the NSAID if that's appropriate for you. All right, and we had some questions about some, some specific techniques. So uh, the question came, do you use particular um, visualization techniques or other mindfulness techniques besides um, for bedside tools to offer patients. Uh, this person is an occupational therapist who's on with us today. And they uh, said, uh, I think that my patients think I'm crazy when bringing up these as an option. Uh, any advice or um, feedback you can provide? My patients think I'm crazy as well. <laughs> um, it's a conversation that definitely, it's interesting. So when you first walk into the room and you tell a patient that you would like to try to dim the lights to do a hand massage with soft music and see how that helps them, their instinct reaction might be, why? That's not gonna work, you're nuts. I think the, the first, at least thing that I say is, it's worth a shot, try it with me. I've seen it work before, I've seen it do things, I've seen it take down anxiety, let's just try it. And if the patient's not willing to try, obviously you can't force them, but if you meet them halfway, Let's just try one of them and see if it works. If it doesn't work, all we did was we wasted three or four minutes and then we'll try something else and explain to them, my goal is just to help you together. And if trying a alternative intervention, if it helps, it helps, that's great, but let's just try. And then if it doesn't, as a team together, we'll try something else. Maybe it's a medication, maybe it's not. But I do, I would say, take their response with a grain of salt. Everybody is going to be a little bit iffy. You know, integrative medicine is definitely on the rise where you're going to have patients that it's not a shock to hear aromatherapy, to hear music therapy or guided meditation, but there's going to be patients that are inherently against it. Don't try to force them, just offer them, the, you know, your knowledge of if you've seen it work, offer them any kind of literature that you want to bring to them, and then just try to get them to at least give it a shot. Thanks so much, Sarah. I know we're we're at the end of their time. Just want to. I think this is a great way to end. But if you, there was um, one final point you wanted to share before we wrapped up, I think the main goal um, of decreasing opioid use is preparing for what you're you know preparing with realistic expectations, going into the surgery with a goal, and going in with your toolbox of things that will help you during those acute levels of pain. Um, having that toolbox will really make a difference and will give you the ability to tolerate what comes your way and whatever, you know, you cannot tolerate work with your healthcare team to figure out what needs to be done to get you in a level of, you know, pain control. All right. Thanks so much. I know, um, 
There are a number of questions looking for some specific re um, resources that you can provide, Sarah. So maybe we can follow up with you after and uh, we can put those on the website or send them out in a post-event sure. email. Um, we'll also be uh, sending a, um, a video of this presentation as well as the slides. Um, to all of our attendees, but um, sorry, I want to thank you. Uh, this was a really informative and really necessary conversation, and, and I appreciate uh, your time with us today. Thank you very much for having me. I appreciate everyone's attention. Thanks, and I um, want to, again, echo uh, what Sarah said and, and thank all of you who are on with us today and for your attention and for your commitment to addressing the opioid crisis in your community and looking at uh, different ways that we can um, work together to uh, reduce the number of addiction, overdose, and death. Um, I wanna thank you again for participating. Thank you again to um, the Opiate Education Foundation of America, uh, NJ Cares, New Jersey Office of the Attorney General uh, for uh, collaborating with us on this event. Uh, we have shared some information on some upcoming webinars. I hope that you can join us. Um, I wish everyone uh, good health, uh, a happy Thanksgiving, and um, be well. Have a good day, everyone.